No matter how much you calculate and design and pick out components, at the end of the day, a switching converter is still switching. Completely preventing noise was never really an option. So the next thing is to do damage control. More reduction is still possible, but just how much effort and money are you willing to put into it? Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue the switch on power supply noise analysis by looking at what are some of the considerations and measures needed after a design was finalized and components were chosen. While all of the components might look good in the theoretical analysis or in the simulator, when you put them together in real life, things become complicated again. So the first thing to address are the parasitics created by the practical design. No matter how hard you work on your placement, you will never be able to completely eliminate stray inductance. There are however a few tricks to keep in mind. One measure is the size of the components that are being used. While size is impacted by the exact power that you're working with, so there will be a limit to just how small you can actually go, it's still important to remember that most components are available in multiple case sizes. For noise reasons, a smaller component will usually be better. But also, it's worth keeping in mind that components that are placed close to the board will be able to create a smaller inductance than ones which are placed further away. And while not really common for single components, the exact placement of the silicon inside of the package will also matter. So here, the classical way of doing things is by making the circuit on the silicon face upwards and then using wire bonding to connect it to the pins. Now, this is all fine, but a newer, lower inductance way of doing things is the so-called flip chip design, where the circuit is facing downwards from where you have a direct connection to the pins, thus greatly reducing the interconnect inductance. So once you have chosen the smallest, lowest inductance versions of the needed components, what's next? So based on a given component placement, the next critical part is the actual interconnections. So it's not enough to just connect all the terminals, because the exact way in which you do the connection also plays a role in the final parasitic values. So first thing to observe is that a thick trace has a lower inductance than a thin trace. Then the inductance on a loop is mainly impacted by its inner area. So a combination of thick traces with small open areas is critical to minimizing loop inductance. Now, this however is not always a perfect solution since large planes also have a lot of parasitic capacitance, which is not always something desired. So the compromise is to simply keep some reasonable thicknesses, but bring the conductors close together. Now on the topic of inductance and PCBs, this can further be reduced by having planes, usually the ground, in close proximity to your circuit. With a two layer board, this ground plane will be the opposing layer, but with multi-layer boards, you can always foresee a ground plane directly beneath your circuit. Now, reducing inductance to zero will never really be possible. However, just a little bit of inductance might not be all that problematic. But if it is, well, you need some other countermeasures then. So the first thing to address is the way in which parasitic inductance becomes actually problematic. So the inductance will always form loops with either intentional or parasitic capacitors and the various switches present in the circuit. So the LC circuit on its own is pretty much harmless, but once you apply pulses to it, the energy will start to oscillate. The way in which you can predict if this will actually happen is also the way in which you can prevent it in the end. So any LC circuit in reality is an RLC circuit there is always some amount of resistance here and there. And the way in which you know if the circuit is critical is by checking its damping factor. If this is above one, usually it's not that problematic, but if the value is smaller than one, then some measures will need to be taken. So when you have an LC filter exposed to a input square wave, on the output, you will get a nice oscillation appearing. Now, to fix this, you could add some series resistance 
to the inductor, which, well, would help quite a bit. However, this would just lead to unacceptable amounts of loss. So a more common and practical approach is the addition of an RC snubber in parallel with the initial capacitor. With this, you get a similar effect. So the oscillation is reduced, and this is going on by reducing the initial self resonant frequency and also increasing the damping factor. Now, this sort of measure is commonly applied over switching elements, so things like transistors and diodes, and I cover this in a bit more detail in an older video. However, this sort of RC damping can become useful even outside of the main supply circuit. So, when all the possible measures to reduce the noise from within the converter have been exhausted, the next step is to look outside of the circuit. At the expense of extra components, measures can be added to prevent the noise that was generated from going too far. First thing to consider are LC filters. And well, as with any circuit, these can help, but they could also make things a bit worse. Now, you will find both LC and CLC filters, or Pi filters, in common use, and the main reason being that these are low-pass filters. So the DC current passes almost unaffected, but the AC noise bit does not. Now, other than this useful feature, filters also present a couple unwanted properties as well. First, an undamped LC circuit will resonate. With our LC filter, if the damping factor is not considered, it can end up amplifying rather than attenuating the noise. To prevent this, usually extra resistance needs to be added in series with the capacitors. So the inductor needs to have a lowest possible DC resistance to prevent useful power loss, so only the capacitors are commonly placed in series with damping elements. The second important consideration with filters has to do with the impedance that they present in relation to the power supply and the load. So when considering the input side filter, it's important to have the filter's output impedance smaller than the supply's input impedance, not respecting this can lead to an unstable operation. And then on the output, the filter's impedance can again create problems by generating voltage dips during load transients. So here, again, you want the filter's output impedance to be smaller than the load impedance. So to highlight the impact of an input side filter, I took the base test fixture for the ADP1613, a boost converter, and added a transient load to the output. So six milliseconds after the simulation starts, an extra 200 milliamp load will be added. Now, other than the initial circuit, I also made a couple of copies in which I added a bit of input filtration. So to see how all of this works, let's just simulate and well, wait a bit. So with the base converter, well, not much interesting happens. The input side is perfectly stable and so is the output. So after the converter turns on and ramps up to the nominal voltage, things are more or less stable up until the load kicks in. So there is a small dip appearing here. However, after the compensation loop kicks in, this also gets restabilized to the initial value. Now, the first change I made was to add a proper input filter. So as part of the filter, there will always be an inductor present. And on the supply side, I didn't really add anything since the supply component is ideal. So an extra capacitor would not make any difference. And well, on the converter side, there was already a 10 microfarad capacitor. So anyway, if we check out this circuit on the input side, well, we already see a bit of a problem. The input voltage severely oscillates. So the damping of this circuit is very poor. And that causes the initial startup pulse to drive the supply line into an oscillation. And at around the six millisecond point, when the extra load is added, this also contributes to the oscillation. So in general, this is something that you never want to see on the input of a supply. And well, in an extreme case like this one, such an input oscillation will also prevent the output from properly stabilizing and while the converter to start up. So we can observe that the output never really reaches the nominal 12 volts. Now to fix this, in the last circuit, I also added in a damping resistor 
in series with some extra compastants. And the idea here is that this should reduce the initial startup oscillation. So if we have a look at the input for the final converter, while it's not perfect, it's still way better than before. So this circuit is still not in a good shape since the converter's input impedance is very close or lower to the output impedance of the filter. And well, this effect also becomes clear when the load step kicks in. So the sudden increase in current causes the input to dip and this combined with the converter's reaction also makes the output voltage unstable. So while the converter did start up properly, once the extra load kicked in, the converter completely destabilized. So while input filters can sometimes be a necessity, they need to be properly checked to make sure that the circuit is actually stable with their presence. Now, on the topic of filters, output filters can also cause issues. So next, I took the same base circuit and created a couple variations in which I added some output filtration. So let's just simulate these circuits to see what happens. So again, the base circuit, both on the input and on the output, nothing really interesting happens. However, if we add in an LC circuit to the output, the direct output of the converter still looks more or less decent. But if we check the waveform after the filter, so the one connected to the load, we start to see some issues. So again, we have quite a small damping factor, which causes our filter to ring, both at startup and when the load step kicks in, but also the exact voltage that is being stabilized by the supply is the one before the DC resistance of our inductor. So the output voltage, the green trace, is slightly lower than the red trace, which is the direct output of the converter. So the output might not have the correct DC value if too much voltage drop is occurring over the filter. And this will become much more visible at higher load values and at large series resistance values. Now, one countermeasure to this is to make the voltage sensing at the output of the filter. So this should help with the DC level. However, if we now check the output voltage, we can see that this sort of sensing can create more headaches than benefits since now the filter is also part of the converter's feedback loop. In an extreme case like this one, this can lead to a complete instability situation where the output just oscillates uncontrollably. So if this sort of sensing is in use, then special care should be taken to observe the exact impact of the output filter. So in the end, both output filters as well as input filters can be used quite successfully. So it's not like you should stay away from these, but it is important to keep in mind what sort of things could go wrong in extreme use cases. Now, when all else fails, one of the last resorts is to simply put a lid on it. Literally. Though in electronic circles, it's called a shield. So it's not uncommon to have a shielding box either covering the complete supply to form a dedicated module, like you see in computers or measurement equipment or just as a supply module. But in smaller designs, you can simply cover just a small bit of the PCB. This way, the build cost becomes lower and the overall design is more compact. Now, simply putting the supply in a box does not make all the problems magically go away. Some extra measures still need to be taken. So, when you put a noise source inside of an electrically conductive enclosure, you first of all provide a clear path for the electrical fields to close to. This is good since you stop getting direct E field lines from the noise source to sensitive things. Now, what can easily be missed with this simple solution is that the circuit still needs to be connected to the rest of the world. And here, the wires that pass through the enclosure wall are the primary offenders. Now, the first measure to take is one that we've already looked at, adding filters to the noisy wire. So usually a good place to put a filter is close to the noise source. This is quite a good practice in most cases. However, if there is significant distance between the filter and the enclosure's edge, then the wire after the filter can still pick up indirect field lines and take all of the noise outside. So while you have taken care of the main conducted noise source, you're not really out of the woods yet. So one of the best things that you can do is to use a local decoupling capacitor between the interface lines and the shield. 
This way, any stray noise or unwanted currents are brought to the same potential as the shield. So this should minimize any currents that escape through the lines. In practice, this can be done by adding physical capacitors to the line, or if the design is a bit more fancy, you have various free terminal components, either ceramics or higher power enclosure pass-throughs, which can take the signal through, but also filter it at the same time. One of the last things I want to mention today regarding shielding and grounding is that no real life practical conductor is perfect. You will always have some non-negligible amount of impedance. This is probably obvious in the wire, but it also applies to planes. So it's common to consider that the ground in a circuit is an equipotential, always at zero volts and always the reference, but things aren't like that though, though it would be nice. So any current passing through a conductor will create a voltage potential. Now the potential itself is dependent on the current and the exact trace impedance, so especially with things like switching converters where you have high currents at high switching frequencies, the voltage drop can become quite problematic. So if you share the ground with some other circuits, as you commonly do, any voltage that is being measured or passing through the circuit will not just contain the intended signal, but also this extra noise. While this sort of scenario can quite easily be dealt with by physically putting the supply and the sensitive circuit in different parts of the board, having a non-uniform ground can cause extra problems when the ground is supposed to also be a shield. So if you do have significant current running through your shield, the noise, while smaller than without any sort of shield, can still, in certain cases, be non-negligible. Now, this sort of analysis will lead you down the rabbit hole of ground separation, have all the different kinds of grounds, from noisy to power to analog to shield ground and all sorts of other things. All the grounds still need to be galvanically interconnected, but another aspect is that you will have a non-negligible amount of impedance appearing in between the various grounds. While this is not a bad approach, it's one of those things that can easily bring more issues than benefits when not done correctly. In the end, the topic of switch mode power supply and noise is an extremely complicated subject. While there are certain well-established good practice rules, which if applied correctly will take you most of the way in creating a good design, after a certain point of noise strictness and low cost measures, things become highly unpredictable. No wonder EMI design is considered by some a dark art. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.